In the last video, we talked about the orbit stabilizer theorem, which states that the total number of symmetries is the product of the sizes of the orbit and stabilizer of x, where x is any element in the set x which the symmetries act on. One deduction that we can make is that the size of the stabilizer always divide the total number of symmetries. This is a weaker statement in the sense that it does not tell you what the other factor is. Of course, the orbit stabilizer theorem is one way to prove this, but there is another way that directly explains this fact. We have this schematic diagram for the symmetries, and the whole rectangle here represents all the symmetries for a particular object. Let's say this bit here represents those that fixes x, and we have counted them. If all the symmetries fix x, then the statement that we want to prove is obvious, because the symmetry is the stabilizer. So let's say there are other symmetries out there that don't fix x, and we call this new symmetry tau. Then we generate a bunch of new symmetries, as many as the size of the stabilizer. These new symmetries are all compositions of a symmetry sigma and tau, where sigma is any symmetry in the stabilizer of x. Then pick another symmetry we haven't counted, say tau prime. Then again, we generate a bunch of symmetries, in the same way as before. Repeating this process, we will eventually tile up this large rectangle. Since these small rectangles represent that these sets are of the same size, namely the size of the stabilizer, it is now apparent that the size of the stabilizer has to divide the total number of symmetries. That's very intuitive, but there are some details we glossed over. The first is why we generate the same number of symmetries in each process. The second is why we generate new symmetries. This can be further branched out to why these symmetries generated not already in the stabilizer, and why these generated symmetries are mutually distinct from each other. Okay, so for the first detail, we want to know why these generator symmetries have the same size. This just means that these rectangles are of the same size. This process could have generated rectangles like this mess, and we don't know at this stage. In each step, every set of new symmetries has this particular form. So let's say we pick two elements, sigma, and sigma prime from the stabilizer, and compose it with the new symmetry tau that we found. Suppose these two symmetries are actually the same, then by undoing tau, we are left with sigma and sigma prime being equal in the first place. So if we pick two different elements from the stabilizer, there is no way these two compose with tau to give the same symmetry. So different elements in the stabilizer compose differently with tau, and so we have generated as many symmetries as the stabilizer. The second detail we need to take care of is why these sets of symmetries generated are different from the stabilizer. Again, although we have this mental picture, after seeing why these are different from the stabilizer, it can still be a mess because they can intersect with one another. Let's say sigma is a symmetry in the stabilizer of x. Then a symmetry that undoes sigma should also be in the stabilizer. Why? By being in the stabilizer, sigma fixes x. If this undoing does not fix x, then doing sigma then undoing it will move x elsewhere, which is impossible. So this undoing symmetry stays within the stabilizer. This means that somewhere in this blue box there is a symmetry that is equivalent to undoing sigma first, then do the symmetry tau, 
because this undoing symmetry is inside the stabilizer as discussed earlier. Suppose this symmetry in the blue box is also inside the green rectangle. Then we add sigma in the beginning of the symmetry sequence. This sigma surely is inside the stabilizer. Doing something that fixes x, then do something that also fixes x, definitely fixes x. So this symmetry, whatever this is, must be in the stabilizer. But look more carefully on what this symmetry really is. If we do sigma, then undo it, this is the same as doing nothing. And so, this symmetry is tau all along. But this shows that tau is inside the stabilizer of x. But we deliberately choose tau so that it is not inside the stabilizer. So we have achieved a contradiction. This means the initial assumption that undoing sigma then do tau being inside the stabilizer is rubbish. So these rectangles do not overlap with the original green one. The last detail we need to look into is why these symmetries generated are all new, different from one another. That would mean this mental picture is a correct depiction, with all rectangles separated from one another. Again, we need the fact that if sigma fixes x, then undoing sigma also fixes x. Then somewhere in this yellow box, there would be a symmetry equivalent to first undoing sigma, then do tau prime. This is because, again, the undoing symmetry is inside the stabilizer. We want to prove that it is not inside the blue rectangle. Again, we suppose what we want to prove is false and arrive at a contradiction somehow. Suppose there is an overlap between the yellow and blue rectangles, which means that this symmetry over here is somehow the same as another symmetry zeta than tau, where zeta is just some other symmetries in the stabilizer of x. We then apply sigma to both symmetries. Since both symmetries are the same in the first place, doing the same thing to same symmetries yield same symmetries. For the left side, we use the same trick and see that this is tau prime. For the right side, we notice that sigma is also in the stabilizer of x. And again, composing any two symmetries inside the stabilizer should also stay inside the stabilizer. So this symmetry is a composition of a symmetry in the stabilizer, then tau, which means this symmetry here is still in the blue box. But notice that this is also equivalent to tau prime. But tau prime is not in the blue box in the first place. Tau prime is something we haven't counted before. So again, this is rubbish. And all of this is because we believe there is an overlap somewhere between the blue and the yellow rectangles. So that means no overlap between all rectangles. This is an insane amount of effort and rigor to justify this rectangular tiling proof. But the stabilizer of X is not the only subset of the group of symmetries that has this property. Why? Let's look back again at the three details we have gone through. For the first part of the argument, we haven't actually used any properties of the stabilizer. In fact, these rectangles generated must be of the same size whatever set of symmetries we take from G. For the second part of the argument, we actually used some properties of the stabilizer. We first use the fact that undoing a symmetry in the stabilizer stays inside the stabilizer. So let's just point that out because it is important. And over here on the right side, we use another property of the stabilizer. Doing any two symmetries inside the stabilizer is still inside the stabilizer. In fact, combining these two, we get that the identity is in the stabilizer. Because the identity is the same as first doing sigma, then undoing it. 
and by this first property we discovered, undoing of sigma is itself inside the stabilizer. And by this second property, this sequence of symmetries, which equals the identity, is also inside the stabilizer. Now let's see if the last part of the argument gives us more properties of the stabilizer. This bit is really the same, so no new properties found here. And here, we also use the property that composition of symmetries stay within the stabilizer, which we have also discovered before. So this means that these three properties of the stabilizer is crucial to the entire proof. But are these properties only enjoyed by the stabilizers? In other words, if I say a subset of symmetries H enjoy these properties, must it be the stabilizer of X? Not necessarily. But what we know is that proving this only requires these properties. So if any H fulfills these properties, then the size of H also divides the size of the whole group of symmetries. Such an H as a subset of the whole group of symmetries G fulfilling these properties is called a subgroup of G. For example, when we have the whole group, then all these properties really hold. So G is always a subgroup of itself. Going back to the rectangular tiling, now replacing the stabilizer by any subgroup H, all of these rectangles have a special name called cosets of H in G. So now we have this relation. If we want to count the number of symmetries in group G, we need to count how many things there are in a subgroup H, then multiply it with the number of cosets that you have. This is known as Lagrange's theorem, the topic of this video. So now we have derived Lagrange's theorem and the orbit stabilizer theorem. Now notice that the stabilizer is a subgroup of G. So what orbit stabilizer theorem is saying is that the number of cosets of the stabilizer is equal to the size of the orbit. So in a normal lecture or book, they will prove this statement, then we can prove orbit stabilizer from Lagrange. In the last video, we are left with the question of what happens when the group G is actually infinite, like the group of symmetries of the real number line. Instead of saying this statement, we would say that the orbit of X bijects with the set of cosets of the stabilizer of X. This concept will generalize well for infinite sets and is actually the statement of the full orbit stabilizer theorem. But don't worry if you don't know anything about bijection or infinite sets because it is not very important in developing intuitions for group theory. This is just some extra stuff to finish off something that I have hinted on in previous videos. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it. Don't forget to subscribe with notifications on to stay tuned to this video series. See you next time!